If you're anything like me, you have had a dream about school before the school year starts. I had a dream last night, and it was kind of a weird dream. I'm not going to lie. A little bit weird, a little bit crazy. Um, just starting my year off at Scott, and I met some pretty cool students at Open House, and, and some of them showed up in this dream that I had. I had a dream last night, and it went something like this. I'm like, okay, let's just see like how smart my class is. I'm just going to have them count. So I said, hey, class, count. And here's what the kids in the dream said. They said, 12T, 45S, 78N, 10. And I'm like, what? Wait a minute, these kids don't even know how to count? So I said, well, okay, let's try this again. Maybe I didn't hear you right. And here's what they said. 12T, 45S, 78N, 10. And I'm like, whoa, what? What? This is crazy. It kept going and going and going. 12T, 45S, 78N, 10. 12T, 45S, 78N, 10. And then it dawned on me. These students not only can count, but are so smart that they know what the first vocabulary word of algebra class is. Anyone know what that word is? You're right. It is variable. You see, the students in the video were taking out numbers, one, two, three, and replacing them with letters. That is precisely what a variable does. Okay, so if we look at our mathematical definition of variable, we would say a variable is a symbol used to represent a number. A symbol used to represent a number. Okay? Not only do we have variables, we also have these things called algebraic expressions. If I look at what an algebraic expression is, an algebraic expression is just a phrase that uses variables numbers, and operations. A reminder that operations are just any things that you can do with numbers. These could be things like add, subtract, multiply, divide, raise to a power, those type of things. Okay, so these two vocabulary words are our key words for day one. Okay, now that we have the vocabulary out of the way, let's try a few of the problems from your guided notes. Let's see how good we are at reading and following directions. So here we go. Listen up close. Following U's, evaluate two examples. Operations, please, the of order. What? What? You didn't catch that? I'll say it again. Maybe a little slower will help you know what to do. Following U's, evaluate two examples. Operations, please, of order. What, one more time. Following you is evaluate two examples, operations, please, the of order. Oh, you have no idea what to do. Yeah, that's right, because I said the words out of order. Let's try it again. Please use order of operations to evaluate the following examples. You see, you wouldn't try to talk to your friends if you mixed up the words and jumbled them up every time you tried to speak. In the same way, when we solve math problems, there's an order that we have to use to solve them. That order? The order of operations. Now somewhere along the line, you might have heard some crazy thing like, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, okay? Goes with parentheses and exponents and multiplying, dividing, and adding, and subtracting. So let's put those to use. If you would, please look at your guided, note, guided notes and follow the two examples, A and B. I'll give you a couple of seconds to get those done. Hopefully you've had a chance to complete example A and B from guided notes under the order of operations section. I've listed the order of operations right here. Okay, there are four steps when solving problems using the order of operations. One, we'll evaluate things inside of the parentheses. Two, we will handle any exponents. Three, multiplication and division from left to right. And four, addition and subtraction also from left to right. If we look at example A, okay, I can see one of two possible answers. I can see some people getting the answer 20, 
and other people getting the answer 5. One place that kind of messes people up sometimes in order of operations is, is that they want to multiply before divide, which is actually not the case. It needs to go from left to right. So if I look at example A, I need to first do 50 divided by 5, which is 10, and then multiply by 2 to get the solution of 20. Okay? In example B, we have a fraction bar. A reminder that a fraction bar acts like parentheses, which means I need to evaluate the numerator and then evaluate the denominator and finally divide the numerator by the denominator. So if I look in the numerator, I should take 16 times 2 first, then add the 8, which gives me 40 in the numerator. In the denominator, I do my exponent first. 2 to the second is 4. And then because I only have add subtract, I can go left to right. I have 10 plus 4 and then minus 4, okay, which obviously would leave us with 10. My last step is to take the 40 divided by 10, which gives me an answer of 4. Let's check our work from the examples you just completed. If I look at C, it says the quantity A plus B to the third power. We'll substitute in 3 and 4 for A and B. Order of operations tells us to do the parentheses first. 3 plus 4 would be 7 raised to the third power. And 7 times 7 times 7 is 49 times 7, or 343. For D, we are substituting in 3 plus 4 to the third power. In this case, we don't have parentheses, which means we should do exponents first. So we have 3. Doing 4 to the four, third, 4 times 4 times 4 is 64. And then we'll take 3 plus 64 to give us 67. In the final example, example E, we have 3 to the third plus 4 to the third. 3 to the third is 3 times 3 times 3, or 27. We just evaluated 4 to the third, which is 64. Finally, taking 27 plus 64, we should get 91. Okay? The next part of the guided notes asks if 4a to the third is the same as the quantity 4a to the third. We can look at an example to decide whether or not we think that holds true. Okay? So if I look at these two, I have 4a to the third, and this one I have the quantity 4a to the third. Okay? Make a conjecture. Do you think that this is the same or these are not the same? Okay. To test your conjecture, let's pick a value for a. Let's just think that a is 2. Okay. In this scenario, if I substitute 2 in for a, let's look at what is getting raised to the third power. Is the 4 being raised to the third power in this case? The answer is no. The only thing being raised to the third power in this first case is the a. So if I look at order of operations, I have 4. I'm going to put in my parentheses times 2 to the third. If I look at that, order of operation says I would take 2 to the third, which is 8, and now take 4 times 8 to get 32. If I look at my other scenario, this time I have 4a inside of the parentheses, which means I need to take 4 times 2 first and then raise it to the third power. So if I do that, I'm taking 4 times 2, which is 8. Now I'm raising 8 to the third power. If I look at 8 to the third power, that's 8 times 8, which is 64. And 64 times 8, which gives us 512. Clearly, these are not the same. The last statement on your paper says that parentheses are powerful. And they are. Merely by moving the parentheses, you can gain several different values from one expression. Okay, so for class tomorrow, please bring back the you try. It asks you to place parentheses in the expression on the paper so that you get a value of 18. We will discuss this one when you come back to class tomorrow. I hope you've enjoyed the first edition of Scott Tube. I'm looking forward to seeing all of your faces tomorrow in algebra class. Thanks for hanging in there and watching the whole thing. See you tomorrow.